Robert is going to be talking to us about storytelling with data. So Robert is, um, as a career IT professional, Robert's been assisting organizations in Asia Pacific of all sizes, verticals, in finding and maintaining success with their data and analytics. In his 12 years of Interworks, Robert has worked with some of the largest companies in the world as a trusted advisor and solution partner. Are you ready, Robert? I am ready. Awesome. I'll pass it over to you. Cheers. Um, let me share my screen. So you're going to get a double dose of storytelling with data um, uh, with uh, Jamie, I think her name was, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, that's what I'm going to cover today. Um, and this is something that I'm really passionate about. So um, to add a little bit onto my bio, I actually started in marketing and, and got into the online marketing bit, which is where we got into the numbers and stats and then transitioned into BI whew, seven years ago, I guess. Um, so I am based out of Australia. I'm sorry that you're hearing a very boring Oklahoma accent. I came over here around 15 years ago. Um, but let's let's explore storytelling with data. So I've got this little, first off, can I just get some confirmation you can see my screen? It's probably the safest way to start. We can see you in uh, your screen and hear you, fine. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I always say Photoshop is the gift that keeps on giving. Um, if you can learn Photoshop, you can see you can put a little Tableau logos on ornaments, you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so let's start off. It was the night before Fringe Miss, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, except Robert Curtis working on his presentation at 1 a.m. last night. Um, and I was trying to think uh, how I want to do a take on this, because I think one of the things that we, we are very good at a community is sharing ideas and sharing knowledge. I think what Jimmy was saying about mentorship is, is really, really keen and really, really true. And there are a lot of people that you can find on social media that are there to help inspire, to help guide. Um, and so what I was hoping to do today was I'm, I'm a bit of a amateur writer. I have not actually gotten anything big published yet, but I've, I've written thousands and thousands of pages of stuff. And I think about the, the art or craft of writing very similar to the way I think about dashboarding, the sentences, the grammar, all of that is the syntax and the, the technical comp components that you're putting into your dashboard. And that's honestly, that's the easy stuff. It's the themes, it's the development, it's the plot, it's the character arcs, or in our in case of data, it's the storytelling, it's the narrative, it's the interactivity, it's the planning of the dashboard that actually takes the most effort. And I think when you first start out, that's the last thing you're thinking about. You're thinking, why doesn't this calc work? So let's jump in. So this is me. Um, I want, it's basically exactly what, uh, so apparently my bio is, is uh, needs refreshing if, if, um, if I, I, I uh, Regardless, I wanted to share this with you because it's got my contact details on it too. So I'm on Twitter, I've got my email there. So if you do have any questions about this uh, presentation or the talk, please reach out. Happy to give other ideas or resources that might accelerate you. Um, I see that there's stuff happening in the chat, but it's gonna be impossible for me to keep eyes on that and this. So um, if there's anything in there interesting, uh, Sarah, just stop me and ask. Really quickly, I work for a company called Interworks. Um, we're the first Tableau partner, the first Tableau Gold partner. We just, I think a couple of weeks ago, we we're given the very first global Tableau partner of the year. And so when we're talking about mentors and um, we're talking about um, a community from which uh, can help build you, this is the community I came from. So I was very, very lucky to have people like uh, Katie Wagner and Dan Murray and Carly Cap Capitula and Robert Rouse, Tableau's in masters in there to help mold me as a, an IT or other analytics professional. So let's get into the heart of this. Storytelling with data, or another way to think of this is from, from data to ta-da. Like how do we actually make what we're looking at the, in principle, ones and zeros, how do we make that interesting, compelling, and most importantly, actionable? So Robert McKee is an author and professor, and he had this to say, storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas into the world today. Now, he was probably thinking from a business standpoint or from a myth standpoint, the way that human beings have always communicated ideas, but those, those patterns of receiving information and the way those inspires to go do things are innate in our 
our psyches. And I think that's very true. And I think a lot of the folks that are presenting here over the next 24 hours are going to reinforce this. Is it when you give us an idea, when you give us a plot arc, we're going to follow it to the end and go along with you. Whereas if you just give us numbers, it's not engaging, is it? Let me prove it to you. This is what I call Excel face. And this is also the first test that I would ask anyone that's built a dashboard to do. Take your dashboard and put it in front of your colleagues and see if you get that face, which means you have overwhelmed them in terms of what's called cognitive load. There's too much concentration happening and not enough processing on the perceptual side. We'll get into some of the, the terminology here, what sensory memory and all that, all that kind of stuff means. But this is the easiest way to determine if your dashboard's not quite hitting the mark, if you're not telling a story, because this guy is actually just stumbling through your grammar and trying to figure out what these sentences mean versus actually saying, oh, that is a good point. That really is interesting, isn't it? And to understand why the story is important, I think we have to understand what our goal really is. And so let's, let's compare three different forms of communication, an advertisement, uh, a novel, and our dashboard. We really can define very specifically what the goal and the intent of each one of these is. Does anyone have a guess what the advertisement's goal is? I should have said this is an audience participation. So I know there's a handful of folks on there that are probably dying inside if they have to talk. Let's go look at the chat. Where's my chat? To buy it, to make money. Now, not all advertisements, I think you're, you're right, particularly in this one. I don't know why they're riding a Sprite bottle or a 7-Up bottle like a rocket ship, but it sounds like fun. Um, not every advertisement is to get you to spend your money. Some of them, like, like Jamie's before us, might be to, to compel you to take action for a social good. So I think if you were to take it a step further back, it's an association. These people are having a grand old time, and it's because of 7-Up. Don't you want to have that grand old time? What about the next one over? What about the novel? What do you think the intent of that is? Hey, Sam. I, I just saw another Australian on the chat. Um, what do you think the intent of this novel here is? It depends on the novel. That's very non-committal, Johan. The novel is to provide an experience. And through that experience, you might feel emotions, you might see new ideas, but because it is a long form, it can take very complex ideas and put them into a more relatable, lucid, vivid picture for you and bring you through these experiences as if you're living them yourself. Now, uh, you're right, the, the broader, does the novel want you to go against commercialism or does it want you to fear an authoritarian state? Those are more specific. I'm talking more broadly the, the goal of the medium. Now, when we get to the dashboard, I think this is something that some people, at least in my opinion, maybe miss the mark just a little bit. So what do you think the goal of the dashboard is? Hopefully, to prompt action. Bingo. You've got it, Sarah. What should I look at to inform or take action to inform? See, this is where this is this is perfect illustration because I do think it's important to understand the difference between what reporting is and what analytics is. Reporting is to inform. This guy is being informed, not very efficiently. What we want to do as dashboarders, as Tableau users, as analysts, as visual analytics specialists, is we want to drive action. And so the whole idea of taking the data and telling a story with it is at the end of the story, we've answered a question that will then lead to change, action, some sort of idea that then can be made real. And if you think about this more broadly from self-service, if I've got a thousand users of Tableau and all of them are driving action, that's their goal. Not, hey, this is a KPI dashboard that you can look at every day. No, we want, we want something that's going to say, ooh, that's a problem. That's an opportunity. Let's go do it. If everybody's doing that, just imagine what your business could do or organization could do in a year if everybody has those goals and the techniques to use them, to employ them. I found this chart, this is a good thing that I was uh, procrastinating, it's been a crazy week. I don't know why everyone decides to wait until the end of December to do all of their, their, their business that they wanna do. 
Um, I found this chart last night and I'm really, really glad that I happened to stumble upon it because I love this chart. I've never seen it before. This is from an article on Forbes.com. And I think it said something like um, data literacy or data storytelling is the most important skill of the new economy because of how much data and how much exposure standard business users are getting into as a result of um, the explosion of self-service analytics. But you can see that there's really kind of three components here. There's the narrative, which is the story. And I would say that they're, they're, they're very interconnected. The visuals, which is our medium, bar charts, color, all that sort of pre-attentive stuff that we're gonna get into a little bit later. And then the foundational piece, perhaps ex purposely put at the bottom of this diagram is the data itself. And if I just have two of those elements, you can kind of see what we end up with. So for instance, if I have really cool visuals and sexy graphics and I have a narrative, a story in place that engage, that's basically an infographic. I might have little snippets of information in there, but it's basically a pamphlet. If I have visuals and I have data, but no story, that's reporting. That's our profit last year in quarter two was $14,000. That's not compelling. It's informative. Yes, that's great. Now, what do we do with it? And so that's what I love about when you intersect all of these, because they're all equally important, then you get change. And that's that action that I'm talking about. The best dashboards are ones that are going to have a great story, which are going to lead to action, and then it's going to lead to more questions. That's the whole gist, I think, of uh, self-service analytics is we're not looking for an answer. We're looking for more questions, and that will then precipitate more answers. So with that in mind, let me break this down to, I think, would be sort of five easy ways to approach this which is the idea of how we tell our story. So one, explore the data. You have to know your data before you do anything else. Two, what's the question or find the story? Three, wireframe. Four, focus it using your design elements, your visual analytics. And then five, as my wife says, your work's never done. You gotta keep iterating. You've gotta keep refining it, perfecting it, looking for other ways to explore it. So let's go into these in a little bit more detail. I do need to get my little, um timer up so I can see how long I'm going. I started a little bit early. So does that mean I need to stop a little bit early or do I have an extra 15 minutes to rant and rave? That was a joke. I'm going to stop early. <laughs> kind of hold you guys hostage for 75 minutes. All right. So let's start with exploring. This is one of the things that really differentiates Tableau as a product in terms of Tableau desktop versus other tools is how easy it is to play with your data. The click and drag and drop, you're not stuck to design templates. You don't have to do coding unless you want to do more advanced cool stuff. You can literally just start dragging stuff into combinations. And I can't tell you how many times I've done that. I've been like, oh, look at that. That looks interesting. That's an outlier. That's a dip. That's some, there's a pattern there. Um, and I would say anytime you're sitting down to do uh, an analysis, start there. Play around with the data. At the same time, I would always keep, so some people say when they're, when they're learning Tableau or they're learning in analytics or getting into BI, they're like, I'm a, I'm a numbers person. I'm not a creative person. And some people might say, I'm a creative person and math scares me. I disagree with the premise. I don't think there are numbers people and I don't think there are creative people. I think those are skills. I think what we consider to be creative people have invested in that skill a lot longer. And so we sort of say they are a creative person. But if you, if you develop those muscles of creativity, doodling, drawing, that kind of stuff, you will be better at it. If you do study about it, uh, the form and format, the use of color, why graphic designers and advertisers do things a certain way, you're going to understand the psychology of design. And that's going to then influence how you are as a visual analytics professional. And the other thing is document ideas and caveats. So I, I, I I will see something on an infographic or I'll see something on the side of a bus and be like, that's cool. And I'll go home and I'll draw it down. I'll have like a little notepad of ideas. And um, whenever I get into a, a particular design idea, I'll be like, you know what? There was that idea that I had a couple months ago. Let me go see if I can find it. Like, pal, that will work for this one. And you start to make associations. Um, there's a, a very famous American TV show called The Chappelle Show that was on uh, Comedy Central a long time ago. 
And the two guys that created the show, Neil and Dave Chappelle, they said that when you're writing these comedy shows, you have to have an exhaustive amount of information about comedy because your ideas have to be unique and original. And so they knew every skit that was happening over the last 15 years with, with uh, laser precision. And I think the more you start to document your ideas and the more you start to explore what's on Tableau Public, you will start to see stuff and patterns of things that work. And then you can start to draw upon that. Now in our profession, um, as well as any sort of creative profession, there's a difference between stealing and inspiration. And I think that's where you should be looking inspiration. Now, a pro tip, this is something that we did when I was, you know, I don't know, 25 years ago, I'm, I'm dating myself. Maybe that picture of me with my beard with all the white in it was another way revealing my old age but um when we were doing web stuff we would have what we called mood boards and so we might find magazine articles that had a pretty cool little uh graphic combination or color combination we'd see websites and we just screenshot it and throw it into a folder and whenever we have an opportunity to build a visualization whenever i have an opportunity to build a visualization and i've got the capacity to be a little bit experimental versus bar chart bar chart line graph i will go into that mood board for inspiration and so a lot of the, uh, the creativity is just documenting a process and then having that ready on demand when you're ready to go explore ideas as a part of this process. Yes, Yohan, you're absolutely right. Uh, Pinterest is a fabulous way to build a mood board. I'm probably better than my old fashioned way of screenshotting it. <laughs> All right, the story. Now, I know this is called storytelling with data, and you're like, Robert, you should just be talking about number two, but I kind of feel like they're all related. Plus, I, I have a tendency to talk too much. So let's start with the goal. Or in other words, what are we trying to do here? What's the question that we are asking? Uh, and I think you have to start there. And I think most people start by building worksheets, and then they try to figure out a way to put them into a dashboard. And then you end up with this Frankenstein monster of, well, I mean, I thought the bar chart was useful, but that radio that radio bar chart's really cool, and I wanted to put that in there because I spent two days on it. That's not how you start. You've got to start with what is the business need? What is the use case? What is the value that I'm adding as a result of this? A lot of times it's easy. Someone will come from another department and be like, hey, I've got to know what this number is. We've got to be able to steer by it. It's a very focused goal. Other times, that exploration is how you find that goal. Now, I did talk about analytics uh, versus reporting a little bit. But broadly saying analytics, or let me start with reporting. Reporting is informing, summarizing, and then uh, let's call it pu uh, pushing or posting the data. Meaning I got my monthly report yesterday in my inbox. Here's all my numbers uh, that my salespeople did. We did good, we did bad. Okay, thank you for that. Whereas analytics is not just informing, it's explaining. This is why this happened. And it also, analytics is designed to be interactive. So not only can I then go find those numbers, but I'm like, why is this like this? Let me dig in, click, click, click. Tool tips, parameters, filters, dashboard actions, all of those things allow me to go explore a lot of different details inside of that report that can then provide the second and third tier questions that I'm gonna ask as a result of that first view. And then the biggest thing, this is also a really, really big thing when it comes to, marketing and web design is what do we want someone to do on this page? We want them to click buy, shopping cart, create a lead. Well, on our dashboard, we can't neglect that particular point. What do we want our user to do? If we're, if we're literally just giving KPIs or a summary of last month's performance, we should challenge ourselves to do more and to try to stretch, stretch what we're trying to do. Another thing that you have to be very, very keen about is understanding who you are building this dashboard for. Now, it's probably a good time now to kind of differentiate. When I say uh, who and the dashboard and the goal, I'm not talking about the self-service stuff that you guys might go into your sandbox on Tableau server and throw some numbers together and like, bang, I got it, I'm good. I never have to look at that again. You don't wanna spend all this time and energy just getting answers. But if you're building a dashboard for other people to consume, like maybe some public facing pets dashboards, or maybe you're building it for the C-level suite of your organization or for your suppliers, or your customers, or whatever that is, you do need to spend this time doing it. And you under need to understand your, the people that are looking at it and, and what their goals are 
how are they going to probably interpret this? Are they Tableau people? Are they data people? Have they never used Excel in their life? And another aspect of this is that not only the knowledge uh, axis from, from newbie to, let's say, Jedi, is also what level in the organization are they? If I'm going to present a dashboard uh, to a C-level executive, I'm probably not going to go into transactional level data. They're going to find that very frustrating. And it's a waste of their time, quite frankly. Whereas if I'm dealing with a frontline seller or an engineer or an accountant, I really need to give them transactional information because they'll be like, I can't act off of a trend for our state uh, for a quarter. That doesn't give me any visibility into the minutia, the tacticalness that I need to have. So all of these things impact your, your dashboard. And of course, they affect your story. Let me see what we got here. It's funny um, seeing comments uh, out of the context of what I was talking about. So I'm reading back and someone will say, agree. I'm like, what did they agree with? <laughs> um, so I, that brings me to, I've got kind of two main dashboard myths that I like to talk about. And this is, the, the, this is one of them. And this is the idea that I can build a dashboard for everybody, a single dashboard to rule all dashboards. And that's not true. Dashboards are, are tools and they are focused. If I go out into my backyard and I'm trying to build a treehouse for my five kids, I don't take a hammer and only a hammer because that one hammer can do all things. It can cut that board in half. It can screw that screw. No, I have to have specific um, dashboards to answer specific questions. And the more specific they are, evidence will prove the more useful they are. And so whenever you start with a new Tableau user, particularly when they learn about parameters, they will show up with 45 filters and 12 parameters. And they'll be like, this does everything. You wanna learn about sales last year? Use this combination of parameter and filter. But then when you start to say, what about these combinations? You're like, oh, no, no, you would never do that because those don't make sense. I'm like, well, then your dashboard doesn't make sense. Focus your dashboard on your audience and focus it on a question. Those are the number one and two things that you need to do. Um, when you're doing the preparation for building. And honestly, that's the most important part. If you think about building a house, remember I said uh, most people start building their worksheets and then they'll start to experiment. And there's, a, there's two of them that they really like and a couple of them that they've experimented on. And gosh darn it, all of them ended up being bar charts. Well, let's try to get them into a dashboard. Think about trying to build a house that way. I just show up on my building site and I start nailing boards together and then I'm like, okay, I think I can take that collection of boards and nail it to those collections of boards, and then we can probably get a house. No, a lot of work goes into the architecture. Uh, a lot of planning goes into making sure that you've got electricity and plumbing and all that stuff is going to work. And only then do you start building. Another thing you need to think about is any sort of constraints that you've got. And so we've got the, the device, the medium that they're into engaging on. So I have built dashboards that go on a large screen that oversits a shop floor. And so it needs to refresh on its own. It's got to have large KPIs and metrics that, um, that people can see from a distance. Uh, accessibility. Are we dealing with folks, a large audience? Well, we have to take into account visual impairment. Are, there's going to be someone that's colorblind. We have to double encode data and consider that if that's the case. I, I am old and my impairment is my hearing. My vision still is really, really sharp. So I tend to make my fonts too small. Uh, and then I'll get into a room or a conversation with another 44 year old person. They'll be like, I can't read any of your stuff. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm an idiot. I, I should make those larger because not everyone's got good vision. And then when they mumble, I get upset, but I don't really have the right if I make small text. So those are sorts of the things I want you to think about as you start prepping for what you're going to build. The second one is don't build it in Tableau. Now the Tableau people are like, what? That's an outrage. I'm not saying don't ever build it in Tableau. I'm saying don't start in Tableau. This is the idea of wireframing. Wireframing is by design building structures and concepts and layouts in an easier format, i.e. maybe a pen on paper, maybe Visio, maybe PowerPoint, then it is actually coding and building everything only to realize that structure, that framework doesn't work. Wireframing is advanced doodling. Um, and there's some examples here. This particular chart right here, that is four or five pages for me every time I build any sort of 
productionalized dashboard. I'm constantly sort of playing around, scratching things out, writing notes about interactivity. I really, really recommend that you guys do this. Um, I think any creative pursuit, whether it's building a dashboard, designing a car, painting a picture, people start like this. Like you can see a whole bunch of Michelangelo's works that are iterative of each other because he's practicing. And if that guy needs to practice, well, you probably do too. But the thing that's great about this is that if you are working for stakeholders, you can take that to the stakeholders and say, what do you think of this? Don't, don't, don't worry about the colors or don't worry about the buttons or actually what the data is in there. But this is what we're kind of like, you said that this is the most important part of this, that particular metric. Well, we want to lead with that in this particular layout. And then you can move stuff around quite easily. Another great way to wireframe is on a whiteboard. If you've got a lot of folks that are stakeholders in this process, or a lot of times companies will bring me in to talk dashboarding, I will start on a whiteboard and we'll list everything that needs to go on there, the little bulleted list on one side. And they'll say, okay, what's the most important thing? We'll put numbers by them. That's the number one thing on here. And then I'll draw a little rectangle or square and I'll say, okay, let's get it in there. So this is the most important section of the dashboard. This guy has to go here, right? And this one affects this one, okay. This one's gonna show up when we click on something so we can put that over there. And then by the end of it, you've got people that one, bought into the process. Two, they're contributing and making you better because it's an iterative wireframing. Once you have your wireframe, you've got your blueprint. And then really the writer's block, the tableau block, I guess, that you have when you're sitting looking at a, a, a blank worksheet isn't there anymore. Like, what do I want to do here? One, you've discovered your data, you know what's in there, you know who you're building it for, and then you've got a blueprint, literally just replicate that in the best Tableau way. So your goals, oh, I'm still using my pen, your goals. Um, there is a hierarchy of information um, as internet users, which was based off of how English uh, readers consume information. We read left to right, top to bottom generally speaking. So there are components of your dashboard that are more important in terms of real estate. And, and generally, if we were to add a layer to that, uh, that's super important, that's super important, and then that 42 spot is super important too. So generally what I try to do is put the context, the question that I'm trying to solve as the title, any sort of controls I try to put over here, they can go across so they can go up and down. And then over here, I lead with some big, sexy, important visualization. That doesn't always work that way. These are guidelines, they're not rules. But you can see how much more effective that is than being non-committal. I don't really know what my audience wants, so I'm just gonna put a whole bunch of stuff on there and they'll find out what they want. Again, that's, that's probably uh, uh, dashboard myth number two, build it and they will come. No, no, they won't. If they see a whole bunch of numbers and one of them doesn't speak to them, they're just gonna move on and look for some other stuff. The other thing is, is the difficulty in doing anything is making it look simple. Taking complex ideas and making it simple. That's where a lot of this work comes in. And so the wireframe is gonna really help accelerate that. Now, let's talk about what pre-attentive attributes are. And to do that, we have to explain memory. There are three, anyone that's, taken the visual analytics course for Tableau or taught the visual analytics course for Tableau are gonna know these forwards and backwards, but it's worth giving you a quick overview. There's three types of memories. There's long-term memory, there's short-term memory, and then there's sensory memory or perceptual memory. Long-term memory, I like to equate the human brain to a computer. Long-term memory is like your hard drive. So I have five children, I'm married, I have to remember a whole bunch of birthdays. I cannot assume that you know the things that I know or that you've got the data points in your memory that I have in mind. For instance, if I was doing an analysis in Melbourne uh, over the number of sales and transactions we had uh, every day, and I saw this massive dip right around November 1st, most of the world would be like, what happened there? What's going on? Whereas those folks in Melbourne would be like, it's Melbourne Cup. Everyone was at a horse race getting loaded. That's why they weren't buying stuff. I can't assume that you know that. So I got to call those types of things out. The second type of memory is short-term memory, and that's your active decision-making. I want you to think of that like RAM in a computer. And, and we can only hold about seven things at any given time as we're making decisions. But if you think about how you go about your day, that's actually quite a bit. That's more than we need. Like if, think about like when you go and order. If I go and I order at like one of these 
posh new age chic restaurants, they might have three things on the menu. We do chicken, we do turkey, we do goose. You must choose. That's very easy for me. I'm like, uh, turkey. Now, if I go to a Chinese barbecue house and I've got 45 pages of stuff to choose from, uh, snow peas and exo sauce, snow peas and chili sauce, snow peas and uh, oyster sauce. I'm like, oh my God, there's so much to choose from. I know I'm not gonna choose the right thing. That's that stress that we're getting from that short term memory because we've got too many things for our brains to consider. And then finally, perceptual memory or sensory memory. This is the supercomputer part of our brain. If you think about where you are right now, all over the world, you are receiving a whole bunch of data points. You're listening to my voice. You might be hearing stuff in the background, your kids. Maybe you're tapping your fingers on the, on the desk. You're feeling things, the way your clothes are. Are you hot? Are you cold? You're sitting down, your feet on the floor. You're, you're seeing things. You're seeing colors and shapes and, sh and spatial relationships and size. All of these things, you're smelling things. Um, all of these things are, are data points. And if you were to actually try to code that into what a database would record to then reproduce it, it would be hundreds of millions of records of data. Think about how much effort it takes for them to create the Avengers, to create just sound and vision, and how much data that is. Well, our brains are batch processing that at a microsecond process. And so the whole idea of visual analytics, and thus, which is intrinsically valuable to storytelling, is to take as much of your analysis that you're doing with your dashboard and put as much of it as you can into that pre-attentive supercomputer that sensory memory. And so pre-attentive attributes allow us to do that. Pre-attentive just means I'm noticing it, I'm processing it before I'm paying attention. When I walk outside, I don't have to say, what color is that tree, Robert? Mm, doo -doo 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 -doo. Green, that tree is green. I just know it. And I know all the colors that I'm looking at immediately. Now, there's always a point in a, a class or a presentation where somebody says, I'm an accountant, I'm an engineer, I'm a finance guy. I, my brain works with uh, spreadsheets. That's how I perceive data. I don't like the bar charts. I can't, that doesn't work for me. And I say hogwash. I, let's be seasonal. I say bah humbug and I'll prove it to you. Let's take a thought experiment. Let's say that the moment you wake up in the morning and then get to work, you don't get to see anything. I give you a spreadsheet. Okay, how are you gonna find your socks? How are you going to wash your hair? How are you going to get in a car? How are you going to drive through traffic looking at a spreadsheet? It's not a guess. It's not a preference. It is science. Our brains perceive information this way, point blank. So why don't we make our analytics and our dashboards leverage the strongest supercomputer part of our brain? And so there are, there are attributes that are more pre-attentive than others. And then there are pre-attentive attributes that are better for different types of stories or different types of charts. This is the whole science of visual analytics. So color, for instance, is a very powerful pre-attentive attribute. And there are certain colors that are more pre-attentive than others. Our brains learned the hard way, I'm sure, red is really, really important. Red, ooh, that's blood, that's bad. Ooh, red, that's fire, that's bad. So we tend to look at those colors and notice them first. But color change is also super pre-attentive. And there's a whole bunch. We could go into a whole day. We could do a whole fringe fest just on pre-attentive attributes. The other thing that's really important is your chart type. Your chart type is basically the tool for which you're going to tell your story. And again, I know you're probably going to have multiple chart types. But this is why people end up with four bar charts. One, they're, they're probably not asking a complex enough question or they're not, they're not allowing their bar chart to change and modify with parameters and actions. But they may not understand that different charts are actually better for different things. And so if you're looking to do a comparison, you can kind of trace your way up here among different items. So members of a, a dimension or of a set, and you're looking at two variables or one variable, and maybe there's only a few categories. Well, that yeah, that will lead you to a bar chart. But if you're trying to do a comparison over a time series, well, what do you know? That takes us over here, and we start looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. If I'm trying to see a correlation between one or two variables, that starts to take me over here. And so these, these guys are not – Jamie in her presentation said, I'm sorry I used a pie chart. And, and as well, she should be – I'm just joking. No. Um, but pie charts do have a point. 
But the reason that they're sort of like, you know, reviled to a degree or tisk tisk, I can't believe you used a pie chart, is um, people use them for the wrong for the wrong intent. People are using pie charts, this guy down here, for this. They are not to compare uh, uh, members in a category. Instead, they are to try to give you a relative sizing of them. And there are severe limitations to a pie chart. So then you have to decide tree map or pie chart. But they all have an intent. They all have a purpose. They all have a, a place. Um, and so understanding the chart is, is obviously a necessity when you start to understand what you're trying to say. If I'm saying, you know what, I, I'm really interested on, um, we've sold a whole bunch of cars, but we don't know our customers. Uh, are, are our customers older or are they younger? Well, then that immediately should start taking you over here to this distribution. So different ideas, different thoughts are going to necessitate different chart types. And the thing that's great about Tableau is these are really easy to build. I mean, excluding like your Sankey diagram. I think Ann's on here, right? Ann Jackson. Love your Sankey, by the way. Love it. Uh, or your radial bar charts or whatever. But really the, the meat and potatoes, it's a couple of fields on your marks card and on your rows and column shelf and, and Bob's your uncle. That's in a strain, it's a matter to throw that in there. Now, once you've got your wireframe and you've got the pre-attentive stuff planned out, then build it. And what's great about Tableau is Tableau is a very, very strong tool for agile uh, development or rapid prototyping or sprints. Basically, let's do as much as we can and then stop, think about it, and then revise and cycle, 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 which is what we're going to talk about at step five when we get to iterate. Now, we are ready to start focusing our design. Visual analytics is not graphic design. Visual analytics is science and graphic designs is more about psychology and eliciting emotion as well as, let's be real, making the CEO go, ooh, that's cool. Can I click on that button? Nine times out of 10, that's what they notice on your dashboard. So they can work together, but visual analytics has to be more important than your graphic design. If your graphic design is making your visual analytics less effective, stop and restart. But there are things that you can do from a very easy concept. So the first thing is when you are designing, um, I don't know if this is how you would exactly use this term, but I'm just going to throw it in there. Uh, there's a recency bias to looking at your own stuff. Um, like I said, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer and I wrote this fantasy novel about dwarves. I'm outing myself not only as old, but as a nerd, um, 650 pages. And I hadn't touched it in 10 years. Well, my kids are now of an age where I can read them some of my stuff. And so at story time, I'm reading my chapters and I'm like, wow, this is horrible. Why didn't I see, I've just got obvious typos in here because I had looked at it too much. I'd been living that, that work uh, day in and day out. And so if you can give yourself a break and give yourself the ability to look at it from a different perspective, i.e. moving back from your screen and, and having fresh eyes on it, you're gonna notice things or there's gonna be an intuition where you're like, ah, something's not working. Um, and it's probably to do with the chart type or your pre-attentive. A lot of times when you've got that little like tickle in the back of your head, like I don't quite like it. Um, it's probably going to be because there's some part of the visualization that's either going into short-term memory too much, or you're not focusing your, your, your design and your visual analytics on the actual questions that you're trying to answer. Um, another uh, great thing about viewing this with fresh eyes is forcing your friends and family to look at it too. Um, whenever I say uh, to folks, get another person to look at it. It's, it's always as, it's a, as much as possible. Try to get somebody that's got a commiserate amount of experience as your standard Tableau user. So if you can grab a colleague at work, I know it's harder um, than it is with, uh, with COVID and everyone being at home. That's the best place to start. And really what you want to do is you want to be watching for two things because they'll tell you everything without actually having to say it. If you show them your dashboard, and they immediately lean, lean in and start with a furrowed brow and give you that Excel face, you know there's probably a bit too much in short-term memory because they are trying to process actively what's going on. The other thing to watch for is where they put their mouse. Are they putting their mouse in the wrong spots? Are they clicking on stuff that shouldn't be clickable? That is also something that you should probably go fix. Now, most people don't know how to give great feedback. 
they're either too concerned with your feelings, not concerned enough with your feelings, or they just don't know enough about the discipline to actually say, listen, uh, your use of color there, there's just, there's, you got nine colors and it's confusing. So they may not have the technical acumen to read, but you can still get a lot of feedback by watching them interact with your dashboard. And when somebody hits cognitive load, they start concentrating. You can see it immediately. So some other things that you can do. One thing to help with cognitive load, as well as just from a design perspective, is don't be afraid of white space or blank space. It doesn't have to necessarily be white. But spreading things out can really help create a narrative structure. This guy being over here with some distance kind of creates a step one for your eyes. You can hear my wife talking to my kids in the background. Um, I should mention it's like 9 a.m. here in Melbourne. So wherever you are, whether it's evening or afternoon or daytime. But white space is really important because it can help tremendously in the interpretation and digestion of your, uh, of your viewer's comprehension of what you're trying to say. There is a, a tendency, particularly from very technical people, to fill every available pixel. And so let me tell you, there's a road sign study over in the UK that said how many signs is, is enough and how many is too much. And they found at some point, if they started putting all these warning signs in that you're coming up to a roundabout, there's a left turn here, there's a bus stop. At some point, people just stopped seeing the signs altogether because there's too much. And accidents actually went up, even though they were warning people of the stuff that's going to cause the accidents. Again, think about it in terms of short-term memory. We hit a point where our brains are just like, okay, <laughs> The fact that there are 95 different options, we're gonna count that as one big cloud uh, in terms of how we're processing it versus the individual parts of it. It's the trees for the forest. Another thing to consider is your labels. Um, this is also a, a Goldilocks and the Three Bears type scenario. There can be too cool, too many, and there can be too few. Um, I think the, the road sign study in the UK kind of gives you an idea of too much. Whereas this example over here might give you like, if I look at shipping times by store, that's great. It's very succinct, it's very art deco, but I don't really know what I'm looking at. Um, okay, I see that these are shipping times by store, but are these weeks, hours? And so when we come down here, I can see, okay, this is the average, that's helpful. This is a 12 month sample, it's even better. Average of shipped items only, okay, we might be able to edit that out, I think potentially redundant. But down here, this is super useful, average days to ship. I could probably just sync that down to maybe just days because I've got average and shipping in my title. But this is iterative, right? And there's enough that tells the story, there's a little bit where it's not and you're gonna create people that are confused and then there's too much where people are gonna just start glossing over because it's clutter, it's pollution, it's noise. And so that brings you to this idea of the data to ink ratio. Your data is what's important and all the ink around it just needs to be enough to explain what it is. Back to Michelangelo, people asked him, how do you carve all these great statues in marble? He says, I don't, I just remove the marble that's not needed. There's also another saying that goes with writing um, in the editing process um, that you have to edit until it hurts. Uh, because generally you're probably saying too much, you're doing too much exposition, too much narration. And that's true with dashboarding. Take it off, take all the stuff off until you get to that exact minimum that people need to understand what you're trying to say. Then it'll be more clear, it'll be more precise, you'll have more white space. Another thing that you can do to help focus your story is how you group things. So you can see over here, we've just got a whole bunch of stuff put on the screen, but when we start to put some shading or boundaries around it, we start saying, look, this is the KPI section. You might actually think all of these things relate to the map specifically because of the proximity to them. But when we start to sort of put them together, you can, you can get a, a more of a sense of what's going on. This also sort of implies that these filters are for these charts. But now that we've colored it, you can see, okay, these are more for the entire dashboard. Little things like that make a significant difference. But again, um, these, are, these are very easy things to kind of keep in mind. There are a whole bunch of great content and I've got a whole bunch of links at the end of this presentation that, um, that uh, kind of give you places where you can start learning. Um, color, it, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about color. We've got a whole bunch of colors on here, I think eight. 
and you can already start to sense that this is too much. If I said study this chart and then I crossed off all these names and I said, okay, what is purple? You would struggle because there's too many colors to remember. There's eight intentionally put there instead of seven. Seven's still probably a stretch. But what am I using this color for? I don't, yeah, I got it. Each, each state in Australia has a different header. I don't need them to be individually colored as well. Let's use the color instead to reinforce the story like this. All of a sudden, I batch process this entire screen, and I know that that's important. And because it's below this line, my kids are going to daycare, and they're, well, I have twins, so they're like that all the time. Um, that automatically tells me that that's important. And because it's red, and my brain is really triggered versus red, I know it's bad. So I'm using that story. Uh, I'm using those elements to really tell the story. And I don't need a lot on here. For instance, I could probably just completely get rid of that um, to uh, make you understand what I'm trying to communicate to you. The story is told in the visual analytics itself. And again, that's the whole point, right? And then finally, iterate. And I think this is the part of the creative process that creative people hate the most. They're like, I just, I just cannot do this again. <laughs> it's so painful to get from here to there. But honestly, this is what's gonna make your work better. And the more you iterate, the better you're going to be at it. So how can you iterate? Well, get feedback, provide feedback, and then explore other ideas. So I'm, I actually spent about eight hours yesterday building a dashboard for a client over in Singapore. And I would try some ideas. I'd get them on to, to Zoom and say, what do you think of this? Ooh, I love it. Uh, that one needs to change. That's not quite on brand or that's not quite the metric we need. And so then I'd come back and getting them to give me feedback helped break me up from my own sort of bias of me looking at my own work, that sort of glossing over that you get. Taking time away and coming back like I did with that book for the kids will also illustrate to you the areas like, ooh, I would have done that one differently had I not been staring at it for 40 hours a week. Um, I do want to talk about feedback. I have a colleague um, named Keith Dykstra uh, that um, did a presentation internally uh, on how to give and receive feedback. And I think I thought it was really powerful. And so you can see here I've got some pretty standard quotes here. Excellence is an outcome. Feedback is optimizes growth, radical candor, caring personally. So those are those are books that I think are, are really, really on point. But from the bottom one, this idea of radical candor is you've got this sort of quadrant. And most people, this is what your mom will probably do, is you, you show her your, your work and she'd be like, oh, that's wonderful. Nobody could do it better than that. Well, that's not helpful. Not really, right? She cares about you personally, but she's not giving you anything helpful. So that's actually what's called ruinous empathy, meaning you're not gonna get any better. I couldn't take my writing to any one of any of my family because they were just like, this is amazing. They should pay you a million dollars. I'm like, that's not helping me. I mean, I think you're right, but it's not helping me. Now, if they don't care about you, which is this guy down here, then it's also quite damaging. Even if they are challenging your ideas directly and trying to grow you, it could come across as that guy's a jerk. And then after you kind of get calm, I've had people, you know, give me feedback like this. I'll be like, you know what? I don't like him. I still hate him, but gosh darn it, he was right. So we're trying to get those two axes lined up to where I care about you. I'm interested in the success of what you're trying to do, but I'm not going to shortchange you by not giving you genuine assistance and help. And that's what this is. And I think a lot of this starts with listening. So whenever somebody comes to you and says, what do you think of this? You might say, okay, who's your audience and what are you trying to do? Oh, I'm trying to do this for our COO and his team and they really need to see X, Y, and Z. And then you can come into it with a bit of frame of context versus just talking. Giving feedback is, is super important. Also the ability to receive it is super important. I think, I think it's very easy for people to get in a situation where they see feedback of any kind as criticism. And the reality is, is, is the more criticism that you solicit, the better you're going to be at whatever it is you're trying to fix. Because we have a way as human beings of deluding ourselves. Like I'll be at, in the backyard shooting baskets with the kids and I dominate them. And I'm like, I am the best basketball player in the world. I play against any adult. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm terrible at this game. Um, and criticism is like that for our professional skills as well. Um, 
you don't have to be critical. I shouldn't say criticism should not be associated with such negative feedback. But if you really want to get better at storytelling and at just generally the technical skills, um, it's the subjective stuff that really requires the most criticism. If your calc doesn't work, you'll know it. If your dashboard doesn't work, you might need some nudging. So don't be afraid of receiving or giving criticism. It's super valuable as a community. So that is the heart of what I wanted to talk about. I did promise a whole bunch of resources. So um, Tableau has just been on fire over the last few years and putting out a lot of great content. Their knowledge articles, their knowledge base has always been fabulous, but particularly with the advent of the blueprint, there's just so much great stuff on there. So even though I'm specifically calling out pre-attentive attributes, read the blueprint from start to finish. It's super, super useful. Um, my guy, Keith, that I mentioned, did these here, basically four small changes that can have a big impact. So if you think this dashboard looks pretty good, the idea is that there's a handful of small little things that can make it incrementally better. And it's that incremental improvement that the iteration is all about. I have another friend named David Duncan that wrote a whole bunch of cool stuff here. And um, I'm happy to share this, uh, Emily or Sarah, I don't know if you can post it somewhere, but I know people aren't gonna be frantically trying to write these down, it'd be ridiculous. And uh, I wrote a, a series of dashboard articles, I think seven of them, uh, as well as some other stuff. So basically not trying to self promote too much, but let's call attention to the Interworks blog. There's lots of great stuff on there. Um, and color supply and other places like that. There are a lot of great experts in this field that are very passionate about the visual analytics and graphic design, the storytelling aspect to reinforce the data. And a lot of these people do like to blog. So there's a lot of great stuff out there that you can go find. The Interworks blog gets somewhere like 4 million visits a year for a data and analytics blog. I just find that insane. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff on there. Um, we do a lot of events. We do a lot of case studies. I present probably to maybe four or five times a month on stuff like this. So there's a lot of opportunities on videos and other stuff like that, if not within it works. And so before I stop to specifically ask for questions, I did wanna say a little bit of a personal message to the folks that have organized the Tableau Fringe Festival. This is my third time presenting. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for letting me be a part of your little family. Um, it's, uh, it's always really fun to come and talk to the community and hear the ideas that you guys have. So happy Fringe Mass. That's something that I just made up. I'm kicking myself for not calling it Fringe Fest. Happy Fringe Fest. It sounds a little bit more festive. So that's my time. Anyone have questions for me? And well, if, I'm sorry. Go Robert, ahead. this is Emily. So while everybody, so first of all, you're getting just a ton of praise in the chat. Um, while folks are thinking if they have any questions, I want to ask a question because, uh, and if, you, if you're like, Emily, I already covered this, then just I'll watch the replay. However, um, when you started talking, all, talking about data storytelling and there was this um, once upon a time, I think you had a slide that had once upon a time on it. So how do we, because I think data storytelling can be really challenging for a lot of people. Like we understand the concept of once upon a time. Um, okay, so I guess it's like the actual like parts of a story, right? Like, so there's the intro or the beginning, there's the climax, there's, so how do you specifically kind of take those story telling elements that we learned in like seventh grade uh -huh. and put them into a dashboard? I, I've seen, I'm gonna give you my opinion um, and there will probably be people that disagree with me. Um, but when you, when you break down the narrative arc of a story, you've got, I think you could like do some Joseph Campbell type stuff in here, right? So you've got the, uh, uh, like towards the end, you've got your, your touch with death, which is sort of like, oh, everything's come to a critical head and then it gets solved. And then you got the denouement and then you've got the rising action and all that type of stuff. I, if we were to say specifically, how would I tie a story into building a dashboard? For me personally, if you're doing analytics correctly, um, at least in my view, it would be more of like a choose your own adventure story. Meaning um, 
we're creating a platform, we're creating a story, we've got the background characters, everything's there, and then we want the user to interact with it and help themselves tell tell their story. Now, we, we want to understand the questions that they're asking, but we want to try to build into our dashboard the ability for them to explore and ask other questions. Let me give you uh, an example. Someone asked me, what, what, how would you define a good dashboard? And so I would say there's, there's two components there. One is the, um, the time it takes to, to get an answer. If it takes me 10 minutes to get my answer because the data loads slowly or because it's very complex that I have to set up all these parameters, that is one component that illustrates to me success. If it's fast, that's great. The other component I would say is how many answers I can find on that dashboard. So if it's fast and there's a lot of useful answers, that's a perfect symmetry of, of dashboard. Now, in terms of how do we how do we pull that into the specific arc that we would have in a story? Maybe it's because I nerd out too much on the actual science or craft of writing. I kind of feel like we'd be putting a little bit of a square peg into a round hole by saying rising action, denouement, all that sorts of stuff. Does that, I'm sorry, that might be the- Yeah, the, that's fine. You're wanting. <laughs> I mean, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges because we, that's, I think the, what we've learned about how to actually like tell a narrative story. And we're trying mm -hmm. to make that fit from a data perspective. And I think that's been a really big struggle. That's actually why I asked the question because I still can't like wrap my head around it in terms of that um, perspective or that, th that um, structure. So yeah. get your thoughts on it. I think, I think, I think you're right. The idea of, of telling a story in the data is that there's, there's value in the data. And so what we're trying to do is take all the letters and numbers and periods and commas and put them into a format that can be digested and understood so that the user can go on a journey with us, particularly if it's a complex story and you have to do something like a story, or we've got 14 or 15 different versions of a chart on there just really in, reinforce like, hey, this is how we're going to start our business in this particular market next year. That's a journey that people can go on. And that more has more of a, narr a narrative uh, uh, correlation. Um, but I think what we have to, at least in my opinion, as people that create dashboards, we have to take one aspect of a story arc and discard it. And that's, and they walked off happily together forever. I don't know if that's true with dashboarding because one, we're in, we're in constant iteration and the whole goal of dashboarding is to create more questions that, that we can have more answers. So if you think about a dashboard being a story, when we get to the end, our protagonist has the opportunity to go on a lot more adventures. That's the kind of story with a dashboard we want to create. Excellent. I feel like I've, I feel like I've beaten that analogy to death. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Um, all right, so I'm not seeing any questions popped into the Q&A, just a lot of amazing, like, thanks, fantastic, fantastic, fab. I love it. Uh -huh. And yes, thank you for the personalized stockings. That was a nice touch. I do love fringe miss. I think that that's something we should do. Uh, well, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for including me. Always happy to uh, share ideas with you guys. Yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um